We're looking today at something pretty radical, a massive shift in energy strategy, really designed to make those big centralized attacks on power grids, well, much less effective. Yeah, it's about changing the whole target set, moving away from these huge, vulnerable power plants. And shifting towards, what, thousands of smaller points? Mm -hmm. Energy islands, almost? Exactly. And the speed is key here. This isn't some far-off reconstruction plan. It's happening now. A strategic pivot. You know, while things are still incredibly difficult, trying to make essential services essentially attack-proof from an energy perspective. Okay, and there's this figure floating around, EUR. 16.5 million. Now you hear about grid damage costing billions, right? So mm -hmm. 16.5 million. That feels almost uh, small. How can that amount really change the game in energy warfare? How does it stop the blackouts? Well, it's all about where it's going. It's hyper-focused. It's not about rebuilding the whole national grid. It's about building immediate energy independence right at the community level for the really crucial places. Making sure hospitals and schools stay online no matter what happens to the main grid. Precisely. Reducing that dangerous dependence on a few big, easily targeted points. All right. So let's unpack this. We've got information detailing a major new agreement. We need to figure out, OK, what exactly is the tech they're putting in? Who's actually paying for all this? It sounds like a global effort. And crucially, why does this potentially make hitting the grid less, well, less impactful for keeping essential services running? OK, starting with the who. It's a partnership. Ukraine's Ministry for Development of Communities and Territories, working hand in glove with the UNDP, the United Nations Development Program. Right. They officially signed off on this, kicking off the Renewable Energy Solutions Program, and they call it RES, back on October 13th, 2025. And the feeling is very much, like you said, this isn't just recovery for later. It's a strategic necessity right now, today. OK, but financing something like this, especially now. Uh, that must be complex. How does the money actually flow mm -hmm. from international partners down to, you know, putting solar panels on a school roof? Who are the big players involved financially? Yeah, it's definitely multi-layered, shows real international backing. The main channel is the European Investment Bank, the EIB. They have an investment grant agreement directly with Ukraine. OK, the EIB. But the actual funding, the cash, originates as a grant from Germany. Specifically, the Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Climate Action, the BMWK. It comes via their International Climate Initiative, or IKI. So German money structured through the EIB, is that the whole picture? Almost. There's also the implementation side. Getting it done on the ground involves the German Development Agency, GIZ, working alongside the UNDP. Ah, okay. So EIB handles the structure, Germany provides the grant, and then GIZ and UNDP manage the rollout in Ukraine. Exactly. It spreads the load, manages risk, and importantly, aims for pretty rapid deployment. Right. Let's get to the core of it then, the resilience mechanism, that oh. EUR 16.5 million. We know it's not building a giant power station. Mm -hmm. So what are they buying? What tech creates this decentralization? They're essentially buying operational continuity. It's all about installing thousands of smaller renewable energy systems. So think solar panels on roofs, energy efficient heat pumps to reduce demand, and this is absolutely critical high capacity battery storage. Batteries, right. So solar powers it during the day. And the batteries keep things running overnight or if the grid goes down, it's a fundamental shift away from a few big points of failure towards thousands of local power sources, little microgrids effectively. And they're being smart about where these go, right? not just randomly scattered. Extremely strategic. The focus is squarely on essential social infrastructure. We're talking schools, kindergartens, and critically, hospitals. Resilience where it protects the most vulnerable people. And they're pushing this out everywhere, even close to the fighting. That's the commitment. The documentation specifically says installations will happen even in frontline regions. The whole point is guaranteeing that essential health and education services continue, even under pressure, fortifying these civilian buildings, turning them into reliable energy islands. OK, this is where, for me, it gets really fascinating from a strategic angle. The agreements mention achieving prosumer status for these places. That sounds like more than just having backup power. What does prosumer mean in this context? How does that play into resilience and recovery? Yeah, prosumer is a key concept here. It means these institutions, like a hospital or school, aren't just consuming energy. They're also producing it with their solar panels. 
Okay, producing for their own needs. Yes, but critically, if they generate more energy than they need at any given moment, say, on a sunny afternoon, they can feed that surplus back into the main grid. Oh, so they're not just self-sufficient. They can actually help stabilize the wider grid when it's up and running. Exactly. It's kind of a triple win. First, they slash their own utility bills using solar and efficient heat pumps, freeing up money. Second, they dramatically cut their dependence on that vulnerable central grid. If it goes down, the hospital keeps running. Third, they ensure those vital services continue even in the event of grid disruptions. It provides real strategic depth. Like First Deputy Minister Alona Scrum put it, energy independence isn't some future luxury, it's a necessity for recovery right now. That right now part really gets home. And that right now capability is absolutely underpinned by the batteries. Solar's great when the sun shines, but the batteries are what guarantees power through the night or during, say, a two-day outage. A hospital with this setup might be able to run its critical systems for 48 hours completely disconnected. That's real resilience. Wow, okay. Connecting this outwards. Christophorus Pilatus from UNDP talked about this being rebuilding better and greener. It links sustainable energy for health and education directly to making communities tougher, more resilient. Let's just pause on that thought. Yeah. If every school, every hospital becomes its own little power island, able to run for days independently, how does that mess with an attacker's strategy? Especially if that strategy relies on causing chaos by cutting off essential services. It fundamentally changes the calculus, doesn't it? If you take out a few major substations hoping to cause widespread blackouts and demoralization, but the local hospital keeps running, the school stays warm, the water pumps keep working because they have their own power. The strategic impact of your attack is drastically reduced. It makes targeting infrastructure much less effective at achieving those broader disruption goals. Precisely. It becomes a much harder, less rewarding strategy. So thinking long term then, this RES program, it's not just a quick fix for wartime problems. It sounds like part of something bigger for Ukraine's energy future. Oh, absolutely. Not just temporary. It's explicitly framed as part of modernizing the entire energy system. It's a step maybe an accelerated one due to circumstances towards integrating Ukraine's grid with the European Union's energy framework down the line. So immediate resilience and long-term green transition goals kind of rolled into one. Exactly. It tackles the immediate tactical threat grid vulnerability while simultaneously pushing forward on strategic goals like modernization, green energy, and EU alignment. It's immediate defense and future-proofing backed by international partners. So the bottom line. This EUR 16.5 million, well, maybe sounding small initially, is actually a really focused strategic investment. It counters the vulnerability of the old centralized grid by building these resilient local green energy hubs for the most essential services. Yeah, especially in those frontline areas, it's an asymmetric response, really, to traditional infrastructure attacks. Okay, so here's something to think about as we wrap up. Consider the operational shift this forces. If decentralized power becomes standard for critical sites, an attacker can't just hit five or six big power stations anymore. No, they'd have to target potentially hundreds, maybe thousands of individual buildings, schools, hospitals, clinics spread all over the place. Think about the resources, the intelligence, the sheer difficulty of doing that effectively, and the political risk of being seen hitting that many civilian sites directly. How does that fundamentally change the risk-reward calculation for military planners considering energy attacks? That shift, well, it seems like it's already happening. It certainly looks that way. You've been listening to J&J's Military Report, where we analyze the latest in military strategy, global defense, and advanced weaponry. We'll catch you next time.